Hello again and welcome. I hope you're all healthy and hanging in there. Looks like I haven't produced any content in about six months. So this video is not going to be about multimeters or transient testing. Instead, this video is going to be a response to a member on the EEV blog who goes by the name of Breaking Ohm's Law. He started a thread called Challenge Thread, the fastest breadboard oscillator on the mud ball. So here we have a couple of oscillators. This is one that I had put together to demonstrate importing touchstone files into SPICE when I was using the Nano VNA. This one I built for another demonstration. This is straight out of the ARRL handbook. Somebody had asked me about using the Nano to measure crystals. Essentially what they wanted to do was make a crystal filter. So I've been posting up on the EV blog about that. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to make a video, but I'll post a link to that in the description. I'll also post a link to Breaking Ohm's Laws thread. So from the title of his thread, this is essentially what he wants you to do is use a piece of breadboard like this one and build up an oscillator and see how fast it can go. So he starts out showing a 7.7 megahertz oscillator that he had built. He's came up with a few different rules that have made this quite the challenge. I'll just read these off. The first one is no ICs. So originally when he had posted this, I thought, you know, maybe just a TTL ring oscillator or something. So no 555 timers or anything like that can be used. The next rule is no crystals or MEMS, etc. So where these two oscillators are crystal controlled, those would not be allowed. So you're looking at using some other type of technology. Rule three is no soldering except to add wires to SMT parts. All electrical connections between individual parts must be made by the breadboard contacts. So for example, if you had an inductor and a capacitor, so in other words, you're not allowed to just solder the components together. You started out with a rule saying that the output signal shall be sinish and be able to drive a 10K ohm load at at least five volts peak to peak. Typically for RF work, we're not working with 10K ohm loads. So I had requested that he change that rule to basically allow for 50 ohm systems. One of my concerns with that too was the amount of voltage he was requiring. I have test equipment here that I'd be a little concerned about applying that high of a voltage to. Of course, you could look at doing something like impedance matching, you know, and just calculate the ratio. The problem I saw with that is that if you really want to run fast, which is really what the thread was about, it would be nice to try to minimize some of that. So he's added a note to this rule that says update. You may deviate from this rule within reason. So everything that I've been posting so far is basically based on a 50 ohm system and I've been typically hitting about zero dBm but I think you could run lower. I don't see that as really a problem. The next rule is self-made discrete parts are allowed and encouraged. Keep that in mind. The next rule is no cheating. Drilling hole through your workbench to connect your tracking generator to the underside of the breadboard would be frowned upon. <laughs> It would probably be more effort for me to be drilling a hole through my workbench than it would be to actually come up with an oscillator. So we'll leave it at that. The next rule is post an image of your breadboard and counter or scope and then a brief info on the type of oscillator used. Then he talks a little bit about bonus points. Of course there's no participation trophies. As a matter of fact there was no award at all. He says that the aim was to achieve the highest frequency on the EEV blog forum. The current record holder may call themselves the incumbent master oscillator for the time that the record is held. So basically bragging rights. So I'm going to tell you right now, I probably have an unfair advantage over most of you. Over the years I've gotten pretty good at making high speed oscillators. The problem I have is normally it's a result of me trying to design a high speed amplifier and it just oscillates. Of course the first thing you need to do is find a transistor. Typically what I like to use is like the 2N3904s and these would work fine for a low frequency oscillator. The problem is, is I don't want to build a low frequency oscillator. This guy is looking for the fastest oscillator that can be built up on a breadboard. And a 4401 in that case is not going to cut it. I have quite a few RF transistors. Here's some really old ones. These unfortunately are for a fairly low frequency. I have some FETs that I've used that are good for, I don't know, maybe 400 megahertz or so. But for my goals, none of those are going to work. I definitely need a faster part. You may remember when I was demonstrating the Nano VNA, one of the things that I showed was a transfer relay. And one of the things that I demonstrated with that 
was biasing a transistor in a small test jig and I showed it uh, producing some gain and what I'm going to do is scavenge that transistor off that test board and we're going to be using that on this breadboard so again he's allowed us to mount surface mount parts on the breadboard so my plan is essentially to take some copper wire plug it in fold it over and snip it off to the lead length that I want and then solder my connection to that pin a little advice if you're going to join in on the fun each of these columns I'm sure you're aware are connected so these five pins these are all connected and then these are all connected of course between here and here forms a capacitance the problem that you run into is between here and here also forms a capacitor and between here and here forms a capacitor and between here and here forms an inductor so you need to consider all the parasitics depending on how fast you're trying to run in this video where we're trying to set a record I guess for whatever it's worth all that is going to become very important this is my first attempt at making an oscillator you can see it's running at 1.2 gigahertz one of the things that had happened is the knob fell off of my LaCroix scope again I wasn't able to find it I suspect it's a cat toy this is a close-up view of the first oscillator you can see the small trimming capacitor this is with the attached to the LaCroix scope again this is well beyond the bandwidth of this scope I think it's rated for 600 megahertz you can see it's throwing up the correct number for the frequency at 1.2 gig this is with it attached to a step attenuator we're gonna hook it up to our signal hound uh, this is zoomed in running real time uh, this is showing the occupied bandwidth of 48 kilohertz and again this is with it attached to our LaCroix scope and we can see it's still able to read the frequency but of course the amplitude is going to be quite attenuated but you can see it's uh, running wrist mode yep so 100 giga samples again this is with it attached to the signal hound and we can see 1.4 gig get an idea what kind of distortion we have so I had some questions as far as construction techniques so I started asking them really what's going to be acceptable as far as how you build this thing up basically could I stitch a ground plane together can I use coax I didn't know if I was going to use any of these techniques at first but then it came a question of really what does he mean by a device and I started asking like these different pieces of wire here are these all inductors or are they just pieces of wire because when you start working with RF even a piece of wire could be something like a capacitor it could be a delay line it could be an inductor you know it really depends and so I wanted a clear definition as far as what it was that was going to be allowed one of the things I did was I put together a little choke and it's on the right you can see so there's a set of wires that are twisted together and then basically a coil is made off of one essentially what this is is a DC block or an LC filter in this case going to be used as a three terminal device I was basically wanting to know if I do something like this am I allowed to solder these pins straight to the component I drew up this little schematic in where I'm showing P I'm plugging it into the breadboard but where I'm showing S I'm soldering it directly to the component basically you can see what I'm trying to do is isolate the base of the transistor from that huge connector block and so that thing is basically just floating out there in free space except it's got all these parasitics it turns out uh, he approves this technique uh, but not until after I had ran some more demonstrations so here we are running this technique and I'm up at 1.9 gigahertz here it is attached to the scope you can see it's attenuating the signal pretty badly uh, this is 200 giga samples and it's just not able to display it so I brought out my old oscilloscope and we can see it's kind of a sine wave here it is with the next phase uh, running at 2 gigahertz just slightly faster you get an idea how stable the oscillator is when it's just sitting here running so here I build up a couple of conical RF coils and that's what I was running on that last experiment uh, so I did get some gains out of that here it is attached to our faster LaCroix scope 
and here it is attached to the uh, signal hound so here you can see I've wound up several different conical coils to the right you'll see a piece of uh, semi-rigid coax and this is the actual output connector that I'm using and that little piece of wire that's wrapped around the tip of that is forming a capacitor essentially this is going to allow me if it's allowed to remove a little bit more of the breadboard material hopefully reduce the parasitics a little further and you can see it's now running up at 2.7 gigahertz so then I decided I would just try to do everything with wire uh, there's a small RF choke in the upper right uh, that's capacitively coupled to the coax and there's a small wire that's threaded down inside of another coil which is forming another capacitor and then that's twisted up with our output circuit and then that's attached to the large conical coil which will connect down to the breadboard again the idea is basically try to minimize the parasitics so here we are trying that new circuit out and you can see we're at 2.7 gigahertz now and you get an idea again how stable the oscillator is and here it is attached to our LaCroix scope you can see it's definitely connected and this is with the latest version attached to the signal hound again you can see it's displaying roughly 5.6 gigahertz or so show you some of the different modes one of the things I mentioned is how unstable the device is here you can see I'm using the real-time mode of the signal hound and you can see how I'm moving that around that is my hand located probably three feet away from the circuit and I'm just waving it about that's enough to cause that kind of an effect with this oscillator again you know we're running at uh, you know 5.6 gigahertz or so uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going to come into play with this I thought about putting the whole device inside of my cookie can basically to use it as a makeshift shield And finally, this is where we are today. I'll just let you watch the video.
So if you own a bunch of high-speed test equipment and you enjoy making oscillators and you got a little bit of time to waste, come on out. I'd enjoy the competition. Later.